Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast with Keith Green, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Make sure to follow our social media and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on all our great content. Now, on to today's episode. So Larry, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get into, or why did you get into the idea of sound money and gold? Uh, Well, let's see. We could do the long version or the short version or or maybe the medium, the just right version. Let's do the Goldilocks version, yeah. The Goldilocks version. So, um, yeah, so I um, became concerned about our, our current monetary system. I mean, really started looking at it probably back in the 2008 uh, time frame. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was following the presidential race at that time. And uh, Ron Paul kind of introduced this idea of the inflation tax into the discussion you know, talking about monetary policy. And I know, you know, we've had discussions about inflation and, and what the real, you know, impact of that is, but that was kind of the trigger for me. And I was thinking, you know, it would be nice to have some alternatives. And as I started thinking about it, looking, I said, you know, really, we've got a number of different currency alternatives existing right now for U.S. citizens. You've got the Federal Reserve note. You've got base metal coinage, which is you know pegged to the Federal Reserve note. But you also have a number. So I just have to interject. My technical term for those things, I call them slugs. Slugs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so you got so you got the slugs, but then also you know back in '85 during the Reagan administration, they reintroduced legal tender precious metal coin, and I thought, well, that's good. If we could just popularize the use of that, uh, maybe that would become a real alternative that people could use. And I thought, you know, maybe the next best step would be to talk to my local representative, because I think, you know, under the Constitution, where it says no state shall make anything but gold or silver coin a tender and payment of debt, it occurred to me, hey, that's a reserved power to the states. Even though it sounds like uh, thou shalt not, there's actually embedded within that a recognition that. Gold and silver coin can be recognized as legal tender. Well, I was going to say more broadly that the state can make something a tender a payment, and then within that uh, mandate that the state is going to make something a tender a payment, it can only be gold or silver. Exactly right, and so from that, that was kind of the genesis of the idea. I remember, you know, I was sitting in my easy chair on a Sunday afternoon, just kind of rocking back and forth, thinking about things. I pulled out my, you know, my smartphone. Forget what I had back in 2008. I think it was an iPhone. Not sure how long they've been out, but I had I had the Constitution on there, and I went and I reminded myself of that provision. And the very next week, I set up a meeting with our local representative in the state legislature, who is now our state auditor and has been for the last several years. And so we had a little meeting in my office. Invited a few representatives. I drafted what I called the Specie Legal Tender Act. Uh, It was a 20-page masterpiece, and by the time the Legislative Council got done with it, it was down to about two pages or less. (laughs) That was, so that was in 2009, actually, I think, that that occurred, and we actually went up, got a hearing with some of the members of the legislature. It was put on for review um, over the summer, and uh, the very next year, Utah became the first state in more than 100 and years to recognize gold and silver coin as legal tender. And since that time, we've had a number of other states step in and um, take similar actions. So I think we're up to, let's see, so that was in 20, 2011. And then in 2012, we had some amendments in 2014, Oklahoma. So, so how long was the process from the time that you drafted that to the time that so you got adopted it in 2011? Was that? It was really... Yeah, it was really, it, so it was in 2009 that we, I had that initial conversation, but it was the 2010 session when I went up and spoke with uh, some of the members of the legislature. And then it was, you know, reviewed by committee while they, while the um, legislature was not in session. So it was the very next general session, 2011, that we um, got that through the legislature. And 
it was interesting. Our sponsor was stopped in the hall by the legislative media kind of correspondent and says, what are you doing with this legal tender bill? I'll tell you, nothing has gotten the kind of attention that this has for anything that we've done in, in the time that I've been on this job. He says, we've got, we've got um, you know, inquiries coming from all around the globe. Um, in fact, we had we had a couple of different documentary film crews come out. I remember one from China, you know, they were interviewing and putting together, is this going to be the new money? And so there seemed to be a lot of excitement about it um, at the time we held. And I believe you may have attended this. Do you remember the sound money um, summit that we held up at the University of Utah in I think it was the summer of 2011. It was just right after that. We had people from about a dozen different states and half a dozen countries all converge. And we talked about, you know, what are the implications of this? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I thought, oh, everything's just going to change overnight. We'll be buying our groceries with, with you know, uh, silver eagles. <laughs> it, yeah. takes, you know, it takes a while, but but we are seeing we are seeing changes in behavior. And I think, you know, back then, right, we were just coming out of the big re recession, kind of that financial institution reset, right, 2008, 2009. And so this, that seemed to be kind of a prime time for people to really consider the role of money in their lives, right? And then just recently with everything going on in the world, you know, we've seen gold reach an all time high after really a relatively quiet period right? I mean, things, I think once we got past 2011 or so, gold did what it normally does. You know, if the economy's chugging along, gold's going to kind of stay pretty even keel, right? And it's, it's really at times of turbulence and change when gold steps in and performs its, its function, which is, you know, to be that, that safe harbor. And I think we're seeing that now, yeah, I was going to say, so after 2011, price of gold came down, you know, gradually. It wasn't like a giant right. it crash. It settled down to a very um, kind of base state that it remained at. And if you look at gold prices, right, that's what it does, right? It goes that, in these stair steps. That it, what's interesting thing about that base state is the absolute floor in the gold price post-2011 was the ceiling of the gold price pre-2008. Yeah, yeah. So there was a quantum right. step up, and then you can get jitter above above that that new floor, but not below. And now, you know, price obviously again being you know near its all time high. The other thing I was going to say about uh, these crises is that every time something like this happens, a whole bunch of new people discover gold for the first time. I don't think the old people who discovered it like undiscover it and go back to sleep. I think there's a whole new crowd of people that for whatever reason, you know, become concerned or, you know, take suffer right. big losses or something happens. And then they're like, wait, let me understand this monetary thing. And then, you know, it's a giant rabbit hole that you can go down as deep as you want, but they come to gold and then they start to think, you know, when you were talking about the inflation tax and Ron Paul, the first thought that came into my mind is, isn't it incredible that in any other field of, of endeavor, let's say it's, you know, engineering, we're talking about length and the meter, or um, if we're talking about mass, you know, you're building a car and you understand the rotational mass of the wheel or whatever. In all other fields, you want a unit of measure that's consistent and predictable and the same for everybody and doesn't change, you know, yeah. over time. And, um, but for some reason in money, it's deemed to be more better, you know, as a more better comrade to, um, you know, have a unit that keeps changing and it, it's relentlessly losing 2% every year. And somehow this you know, is- I, I think if there was, if there was some kind of a um, entity that was in charge of managing the inch, like let's call it inch ink, right? Then you might see something similar because there might be some kind of financial incentive for them to, you know, shrink or expand the inch, you know, over time. Thankfully, that doesn't exist with most most of our measures, but but kind of really absurdly in the monetary field, we have this thing where people feel like they have to manage what has worked for centuries. Yeah. As, and then as and then money. they have an Orwellian component to it, which is they have a, a mandate by Congress under the legislation to have price stability, which is defined, Orwell would be looking down on this and saying, guys, this wasn't supposed to be, that book was supposed to be a warning, not a recipe. Um, <laughs> you know, price stability is defined as 
relentless 2% inflation forever. Right. You know, price stability, and uh, which is just truly Orwellian. Um, yeah. And everybody just takes this as like, this is normal. This is fine. This is how it should. This, this gives us a better economy somehow. And you have more employment and more GDP and more whatever. And um, so, yeah, imagine if the, if the inch was shrinking. And then we'd say, yeah, our cities are getting taller and taller and taller. We only used to build 50 or 60 stories. We now have these 1800 story buildings. And, and look at human beings themselves, you know. We've grown so much in stature, right? I mean, massive. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not six foot one. I'm 60 feet, 10 inches <laughs> you know, in the new in the new inch, right? Which is now short. Right, right. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's like an emperor's new clothes kind of world. Like everyone's standing around going, ooh, ah, you know, those clothes are so beautiful. And nobody willing to admit, wait a minute. We all know this is nuts. We just yeah. go along to get along. And, uh, right, you know, right. Also, I, mean, I interjected in, in your, your point, but I, No, no, you're you're absolutely right. And you had mentioned earlier about you know every time there's one of these kind of shocks to the economy, you have a new group that discovers you know gold. But you know there is something about that. You know we've been working recently um, at UPMA and and some of the associated organizations with um, coin dealers. And there does seem to be this feeling that the kind of the gold stackers, you know, is kind of a generational thing and that maybe the rising generation is not really as kind of uh, plugged in to the idea of sound money um, as maybe, maybe some have been in the past. I, I don't know how accurate that is, but, but one thing that seems interesting is we've been experiencing experimenting with not only U.S. minted coin, but also with some alternatives. And the one thing in this entire period, uh, the introduction of the gold back as this note that has, you know, gold embedded in it really seems to have captured the imagination of the younger generation as, oh, oh, I see how I could actually use this as money. I could actually go in and into the hardware store and buy some nuts and bolts with this, you know, or or uh, get a haircut or whatever. So I think that one thing that's kind of interesting is understanding how how the form of gold or the form of currency actually drives its adoption. I mean, we have really been surprised. In fact, Utah just passed a law basically recognizing the gold back as a currency just this last session. And then if you look at kind of the YouTube interest in it and that kind of thing. I just, I've been frankly really surprised to see because, you know, it carries a higher premium than like a normal coin would or a bar for that matter. Mm -hmm. And yet there seems to be this, this embracing this adoption. I, I would be interested in your thoughts on kind of human psyche as it pertains to money and, uh, and, and why you know, that might be the case. But I, but I think that we do, as those working in the area of monetary reform, I think we need to kind of keep things fresh. And I know at Monetary Metals, you're really doing that. You're reinventing the, the old uh, Anglo-American monetary system by putting back in place the pieces that were necessary for a monetary system actually to work, to be able to deposit gold and get a return on. So there's some things that, you know, innovators like you um, are doing and, and like the Goldback folks and others that are, I think, really driving adoption by a rising generation. Yeah, I, I was, I, the ironic contrast is what we're doing is very old. But every yeah. once in a while, I get somebody who like tries to catch me and a gotcha, gotcha. You know, it's not a new idea, Keith. You know, it's been around for, you know, a hundred years. And I'm like, actually a couple of thousand years. Yeah. And yeah. it's not new, but we've obviously made it relevant for today. The gold back, by the way, I wouldn't call it note because note is a archaic word for credit. Mm, yeah. Um, I think, I think you got to come up with a coin, a really good word for, because it, it's self-containing. It's not a promise. To it's pay actually, gold. it's actually a negotiable instrument is what it is where unlike right. it, where, where the, where the, the collateral to fulfill is in the note itself. Right, it, it's self-contained. It has the gold. Right, right. No one's promising to pay you the gold. It is the gold right here. It is the gold, and, yeah. Which is very new and very high tech because historically, and, and there's several reasons for silver being also a monetary metal, but clearly one of them is that gold is too big for small amounts. Yeah. And the gold back, you know, allows small amounts to be very convenient 
And I was going to say, so today, of course, we have the technology to mill a little chip or a little wafer of gold as small as you want. However, it would be like, you know, you'd lose it. If you put it in your pocket, you'd lose it in the lint. Yeah. In the you know, inner corner of the pocket. <laughs> so um, in other places in the world, I don't know if they're real popular here, but in <laughs> Southeast Asia, you know, they have things like one gram or even a tenth of a gram. And mm-hmm. It's this tiny little chip of gold that mm-hmm. floats. Basically, there's a, a credit card sized piece of plastic called a CERTA card. Uh, and then there's a little clear plastic window that's embedded in that. And then inside floating in that little clear plastic thing is this chip of gold. So you can hold it up and look at it, shake it around. You can see there's gold in there. It's too small to touch. I mean, you, you would stick your finger and then it would, mm-hmm. you know, if you dropped it on the floor, you'd never find it. And so the, the gold back is something that's big enough to be handheld and convenient. And it's not gonna disappear in a puff of, of you know, breeze. You're not going to lose it in the lint. You know, if you dropped it on the floor, you'd be able to find it. That's obviously possible because of some high-tech wizardry of how you manufacture that. They couldn't have dreamed of doing that 100 years ago. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I think that it's just fascinating to see, you know, as people look at this, you know, like you see the the big interest in crypto, right? So you have all these alternative currencies saying, hey, we can do a better job than the government has done, which is kind of a low bar, you know, but but, but still (laughs) you have that, you have that inertia, you have that that you know of of what is what you know it's interesting to me that the gold dollar was removed from circulation for a period of two decades 20 years that's it and when it came back the idea with that the um reagan administration had was that hey we're going to make this legal tender available again and they even built into the law that whenever anybody acquired gold from the treasury gold coin that the national debt was supposed to be paid down. Because the problem with the existing system is that uh, if you pay down the debt, I think this happened under Clinton, that he was, you know, he was moving along and he was getting the debt paid down and somebody whispered in his ear, hey, if you pay all the debt, there's no money left. Debt is mm-hmm. <laughs> the full faith and credit of the United States is what actually backs. So you can't do that. Um, so anyway, but the concept under the Reagan administration was that as you put gold into circulation, you can remove debt. So it's just kind of a swap. Now, the, neither the Treasury nor Congress, I think, has ever done that. But um, one of our members of the UPMA board actually had a personal conversation with Donald Reagan who was the Secretary of the Treasury under Ronald Reagan, kind of a funny Donald yeah, and Ronald, I remember that. Reagan and Reagan. And he explained, no, that's exactly how they designed, designed it. So the idea was we're putting the gold out there for people to use as money. And if they'll just use it as money, it can actually replace our existing system. So they, they essentially gave us Dorothy's you know, silver slippers. They weren't ruby slippers. They were silver in the original. In other words, the solution has been with us, you know, ever since 1985, you know, we just have to figure out, Hey, how do we start using it? So it's kind of fun now, you know, I can, I carry gold backs around in my wallet. I can go down to the, as it, like to the local hardware store and, and actually transact in it. You know, the other day I went out to lunch and paid for my, my lunch with gold backs. And so, so it's, I really see it happening. And I think that because gold is such a tactile thing, you know, there's been a lot of gold back crypto efforts that have kind of had mixed success. I mean, because by definition a gold back crypto should be a stable coin, right? right? And it seems like people are drawn to crypto because they say, oh yeah, we need something else, you know, to replace our current system. But really it's just, it's just gambling. They're just rolling the dice. They're, they're going in as speculators because they see the wild gyrations, you know, in, in crypto values. So it's not really a currency in that sense, you know, Bitcoin and plus it takes, you know, 20 minutes to settle a transaction. So that's not going to work as a, as a currency. There's a saying amongst us crypto skeptics. I think, I think somebody produced a video of this title number go up yeah that's the that's the attraction to to bitcoin and other cryptos right and yeah you know if i want ten thousand dollars i put in you know ten dollars and it's just a matter of time before i have ten thousand dollars and isn't that nifty? right and, yeah but uh, then you do have to get it out yeah. so that can be a problem too. oh yes that's a, that's a problem <laughs> so every time somebody's you know telling me on twitter which is 10 times a day that Bitcoin is better than gold. Uh-huh. I'll, always, I'll always try to tweet back and I'll say, Bitcoin is obviously superior to gold at skyrocketing, parentheses <laughs> and crashing. 
<laughs> so if your goal as a speculator is to, you know, multiply your, your, you know, your wealth by a thousand, you know, gold doesn't do that. Obviously, that's not what gold does, but Bitcoin, right? And, and of, course, of course, it also might crash and it might turn your thousand dollars into one dollar. But, you know, hey, that's that's the, uh, you know, live by the dice, die by the dice, I guess. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, really what you want, you, you, you mentioned it right at the outset of this conversation is you want a standard that is going to remain a standard for the long haul. In other words, you want a medium of exchange that is going to be predictably exchangeable for a certain amount of goods over time. So if you ask anybody who shops for groceries, if you just say, hey, you remember a few years ago, how much $100, how much could you fill up your shopping cart with $100? Anybody will tell you it has just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk so that now it's just like a little corner of your shopping cart. So now they've introduced smaller shopping carts. Have you seen that? So a lot, yeah. of, a lot of stores have smaller shopping carts. Yeah, well, it's, it's sad and it's, you know, there's a lot of pain uh, behind yeah. that. No, there, you know, um, there absolutely is. But it's funny because uh, the only thing that's funny about it, I guess, is it's kind of like the guy who's 90% bald but has the comb over. And, you know, what makes it funny is, does he really think he's fooling anybody with those three hairs that are artfully spiraled on the top of his head and stuck there with hairspray? Or does he, is he ready to give up and to shave the whole thing shiny? You know, it, it's like they're fooling. Who are they fooling? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, on a more serious note, uh, was it Solzhenitsyn who wrote it was something like, I'm going to botch the punt line, but I have to say it anyway. They know they're lying. We know they're lying. They know that we know they're lying. They know that we know that they know that we know they're lying. And yet the lies continue. Yeah. It's like everybody's playing along with this pretense. Nobody really believes in it. And yet, you know, it goes on anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because there's inertia and because everybody's bought into the system and there's something out of that system that they get or think they get and, you know, perpetuate it. Don't you think it's gotten to the point? I mean, it, that it's gotten to the point that it's just a joke, you know? Exactly like you said, we know that everybody knows that, and there's so many people that are in on the joke that it's kind of like, I think it is creating a bit of a sea change, you know, in kind of the public consciousness and people are thinking, you know, the institutions that I have relied upon my entire life, I have doubts regarding the efficacy of these institutions. I've got to look for uncorruptible alternatives, right. you know, and, and it's in every facet of of life. I mean, I was talking with a guy just yesterday and that's exactly, I, I just stole his line. That's what he said. He said, all the institutions that I had unquestioning faith in five years ago, every single one of them that my life revolved around, I have, I, I've lost faith in these institutions. So I'm looking for options. And do you want to hear a good one? Where we go one? from here? I mean, I don't think a great reset is the solution you know, no. <laughs> just to pile, you know, more lies on top of you know, what, you know, let's create more of the same, but I think gold is part of the solution. You want to hear gold is honest. Gold but, is inherently but, honest when you hold it in your hands. And that's why I think the gold back, for example, has had the uptake that it has because it's physical. It's in your hand. It's something you can actually hold. Unlike, you know, crypto or where money is going, you know, money is going electronic. Now, of course, there is a place for electronic exchange. You have to have it. But having that physical option. Right. No, nobody wants to have to put on sackcloth robes and tie it at the waist with a rope belt and right. have off the rope belt jingling this little leather purse. And inside the leather purse is little coins you're going to pay for your Starbucks coffee. That's, you know, nobody wants to go back to the 18th century where that's how life was. Did, did, did you watch the Colbert episode? That's exactly how he <laughs> described the Species Legal Tender Act when it was passed in 2011. Exactly the, the, the skit that you had. He had a guy come in. I, know, no, I didn't, but that's, I should go look that up because that's, <laughs> that's funny. But I was yeah. going to say, I'm um, talking about trusted institutions and you know an incorruptible thing, which clearly isn't men, um, especially not men that are given the one ring. I, I used to like, I love to use analogies from Lord of the Rings, but yeah. You know, just picture Denethor or Boromir saying, I would only use the ring, you know, at the utmost end of need. Yeah, which means mm -hmm. whatever it's ex expedient, right? So mm -hmm. um, I gave a talk uh, last week at the Muses Institute and, you know, talking about marginal or decline, basically dec decline in return on capital mm -hmm. and the heat death of the economic universe. Anyway, I encountered a professor, Alex Pollock, and he was 
talking about a similar theme and how the Fed has basically converted itself. I've heard one analogy, the Fed has made itself into the biggest hedge fund. His analogy was the biggest savings and loan as in the 1980s and how they all blew up. And so, um, you know, because they own mortgages and as the interest rate goes up, the mortgage goes down in value, the Fed becomes insolvent, you know, because assets are less than liabilities. So um, he said, you know what the Fed has done? And I said, what? And he said, um, they've changed. There's a, uh, a set of, you know, Federal Reserve accounting principles. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So you have a different set of accounting principles because you're the Fed. Well, the rest of us have to use like, you know, real accounting principles. Anyway, yeah. they changed Federal Reserve accounting principles to say that if you take a loss on your portfolio of mortgages, you don't actually have to take the loss. And I'm mm-hmm. like, huh, that's so convenient. if I write whatever I want in my piece of paper, then that makes it true because I wrote it, right? And um, there's, there's a decay, forget the purchasing power of the money, there's a decay in the honesty of the institutions and, the, and therefore the, the soundness of the credit. It's, a counter, it's increasingly a counterfeit credit that isn't going to be made good on. And, um, you know, the people that are purveying this crap, for lack of a better word, you know, just glibly, you know, gloss over that. But um, that, that's a real problem when the very basis of every financial transaction has at its center something that's a, a fraud, something that's a lie. And the people so, that are behind yeah. it are lies, liars. So that's very interesting about their their accounting rules. I mean, of course, we always suspected that. Um, and it, it makes sense. I mean, how could you possibly run a program like that without some kind of accommodation, but are they beholden to the interest rate? Are they, cause we, I know, you know, we've had discussions where we said, you know, we don't think they'll ever really raise interest rates. So now after quite a few years of threatening, we saw a slight little uptick just recently. Do they, do they have to live by the, the rule of compound interest, uh, you know, against them or do their new accounting rules somehow well, accommodate yeah. Suppose you didn't have a regulator and you didn't have an auditor and you weren't, you could write anything in your books that you felt like writing, you know, reality still gets you in the end, mm-hmm. the, only, the only, which I don't, I don't think would be debatable in, in the gold community or in the honest money community. The only real question, the only real debate is, okay, what does reality mean? What does it mean to get the Fed in the end? And, um, you know, I, I have a theory, which is basically a lot of people in the, in the sound money movement has been, have predicted a hyperinflation for many decades now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hasn't happened. So long as the Fed, you know, and people use the term printing, so I'll just go with that for the moment. As long as the Fed is printing to buy assets that are money good, and treasury bonds have been up, up, up till now, um, as long as it's buying assets that are money good, and as long as it maintains a positive spread between the interest it has to pay to its depositors, which are the banks, that's the bank reserves, and the interest that it gets on its portfolio, which used to be treasury bonds, but now certainly includes quite a lot of mortgages, um, as long as there's a positive spread there, and as long as assets are greater than liabilities, then you haven't had a hyperinflation, it's been fine. But should the Fed have a negative cash flow, that is, it is borrowing short to lend long. So when the, when the interest rate hikes, interest rate doesn't go up on all those mortgages. It doesn't go up on all those treasury bonds. But the interest rate that the Fed has to pay goes up. That's what it means when the Fed hikes, it hikes the Fed funds rate. Mm-hmm. So um, the Fed is suddenly paying more. If the Fed is paying more than out an in interest and it takes in an interest, then it has a negative cash flow. If the Fed starts printing money to subsidize that negative cash flow, then that is the death spiral that will, you know, if, if it's not corrected, um, you know, trigger trigger the hyperinflation that everybody's predicted for so long. And so I, I don't think that's going to happen yet. I'm going to say the same, I have been saying the same thing uh, now, as I said in 2015, which is, you know, interest rates are not going to go up, not very much. You know, already you're seeing yield curve getting close to inverted, depending on which yield curve you look. If you're looking at OIS versus, you know, treasury bonds, you already see inversion, again, to technical differences between those two things, but you know, there's a million and one reasons why I don't think they can hike. And um, if they persist in this hiking path, they, they will cause great calamity. Or I shouldn't even say, I should say precipitate. The cause has been baked in for years yeah. of profligacy. Now they'll precipitate it, which they don't want to do. And of course, everyone will think they were the cause um, and they won't want to be blamed for it because there'll be a new Fed chair, there'll be a new president if that happens. So yeah, yeah. So, just they'll, roll come back with, or two and... they'll come back with their tail between their legs and say, you know, we're not, not going to you know, keep hiking. We'll go yeah. back to zero. And, so, uh, so I've always, you know, I've always felt that really in the current environment, which I think will, as you say, continue for the foreseeable future, gold is 
should be used as a um, as an alternative complementary currency. You know, you want to use the type of dollar or currency that is best suited for the job at hand. So if you have uh, people that are willing to accept, um, you know, debts repayable in paper dollars, you know, by all means, you know, if you're going to be indebted, be indebted in paper dollars, not in gold dollars. Whereas if you want to acquire a capital asset, and so you may at some point be looking at a capital gains tax, you're going to want to set that benchmark using a dollar that's not likely to lose purchasing power over time and therefore exaggerate or exacerbate your ultimate tax liability. So you so you look and you say, okay, well what's the, you know, what's what's the right tool for the job? And I think that in our current environment, we have a number of different tools. And I think that as people become more sophisticated and understanding how best to employ those in their economic life, things get good or better for them. And they also become more resilient against some kind of catastrophe that might uh, come in future in future days, like, you know, some hyper inflationary event or, you know, overnight loss of purchase power, which we which we've seen happen, you know, in other countries and uh, around the world. And we just think, okay, well, we're in the end because we have the world reserve currency. And so we don't have to worry about that. But, you know, when you look about, okay, what do you what do you use money for? Will you use it for acquiring goods and services? You use it to hold value over time. Although we're told, no, that's, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. You should be investing in the stock market. You know, that's the best way to, you know, hold value over time or in crypto or whatever. But I think that, you know, helping people or just ourselves understanding how best to employ these various currencies in our financial lives um, and spreading the word is good for individuals and good for society. Yeah, you know, you talk about people storing their wealth in crypto. One of the things I've tweeted quite a lot is even during phase one, the skyrocket, crypto is not a store of value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While number is skyrocketing, while number go up, that's not really a store. And of course, then there's phase two that follows. And that's definitely not a store. Yeah, so part of it is, is the reliability of the market itself, right? What's the liquidity of the market? How can you get in and out of the currency? And there's some challenges with cryptos in that respect. But I remember once you told me, I believe, about the liquidity of gold on a global basis and how it dwarfs markets that we view as highly liquid. The number of, you know, the amount of gold that changes hands um, every single day is, I think, a lot higher than people. Yeah, absolutely. And then there are conspiracy theories that come with that that point to the volume and say, look, they got to be cheating because that's more than the annual mine volume. It's like, yeah, well, all the gold mined over the last 5,000 years is all part of that supply. It isn't just miners' output because mm-hmm. um, that gold was never consumed. It's just, you know, still there. Getting back to, to Utah, you founded something called UPMA, which I think originally stood for Utah Precious Metals Association mm-hmm. and then renamed it to the United Precious Metals Association. Talk about that a little bit and what makes that different from, you know, other gold and silver. It's not exactly a company, it's a nonprofit, but, you know, what's the UPMA? Yeah, so philosophy? That's, a, that's a good question because, you know, when we, when we passed Species Legal Tender Act um, passed into law, I just thought that, hey, there's just going to be organic adoption of this. Um, you know, especially gee, all the press that it got. And as we discussed, that that became a much harder thing. So the the focus of the UPMA, and it made that switch from Utah to United when um, Oklahoma passed its bill, which was the next one. You know, and since then we've had, you know, Wyoming and Arizona has adopted some aspects of that as well as uh, Texas. And- but you know, but um, for the listeners, I don't I don't recall if I've talked about this too much on this podcast or not. But Larry was heavily involved in helping in Arizona in a myriad of ways, including drafting things every year that it kept getting vetoed. It was the most bizarre That's spectacle. Right. It passed on strict party lines that is every Republican voting aye and every Democrat voting nay. And then it would go to the Republican governor, vetoed three times by two different Republican governors. Right. And the feedback that we were getting was the governor wanted a smaller bill that had less surface area and you know it was concern so every year yeah. you, you probably had to redraft it a bit to do a bit less and a bit less and a bit less and five years on 
you know, uh, finally was pared down so far that there was nothing left that he could object to. And Governor mm-hmm. Dixie signed it. I had a chance to meet Ron Paul. He came to the Arizona Senate that okay. year. Uh-huh. I testified and he testified and I got a picture shaking his hand and everything. I had a chance to chat with him. That was, that was a unique experience. But so you've, you've kind of helped create a state level movement that went from Utah to Oklahoma to Arizona to other states. Mm-hmm. But, but talk a little bit about the UPMA. Yeah, so the UPMA is, you know, its um, mission is to uh, promote the use of gold and silver as money. And so we have members who can exchange with one another for gold and silver legal tender for goods and services. Um, we, we have also recently introduced uh, lease accounts in conjunction with monetary metals so that members can take their holdings and rather than you know, have a carrying cost for gold. That's always been one of the arguments against gold, especially back when you could put money in the bank and it actually could earn interest. <laughs> now it's a, it's a I, little I, different environment. <laughs> I, I remember those old days. I feel like Pepperidge Farm. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Yeah. I remember those days. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but now, I mean, you can earn more on your savings, you know, in a, in a very kind of secure, safe, because you don't even have the fractional reserve stuff um, that, that a bank exposes you to. Uh, and the other thing, you know, different from a bank and, and UPMA is a kind of a vaulting service is that you own the gold, you own your own deposits. When you deposit in a bank, actually the bank owns it and they just kind of owe you a credit. So if there's ever a call on it, they're first in line, you know, in terms of your money. Um, and then we've we've seen some of the things like with Canada, right, recently where um, they started closing accounts, confiscating money who had uh, from people who had the wrong political views. Yeah. So I, I think that UPMA is not, a, it is not a bank, but it's a pretty good alternative to the to the kinds of services people expect from a bank. It gives you the ability to transact with other people in that, in that group. You can also, you know, with gold and silver coins, we never, it was really hard to get physical transactions going with that, but gold backs has changed that. So we're seeing more and more of our members and even non, you know, people that are not in UPMA getting gold backs and actually using them you know, as money. And then we've got the leases and then we'll shortly be coming out with a program where people can draw on the power or on, on the purchasing power of their gold without actually selling it, you know, through a, a credit arrangement that is not lending. Um, it's actually based on uh, pawning laws. So it's state specific, but it's not, it's not the opportunistic rates that you see with, with most pawn situations. So that'll be coming out shortly. And so that kind of gives you, you know, all the pieces that you need, right? You need to be able to spend it. You need to be able to access it. You need to be able to hold it, get a return on it. And then also, you know, the advantage, you know, a a lot of people don't necessarily want to spend their gold, but they want to spend the value that's embedded in the gold and then be able to replace that later so that it becomes a timing issue. And so we've, we've addressed that as well. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's grown over time. I think we're up to over thirty thousand members now, and very cool. Um, so it's um, but it's but it's been a slow progress. Did you, did you envision anything like that when you founded it back in twenty eleven or twenty twelve? You know, I didn't know really what to expect. I really didn't. And I, I, in all honesty, I think that it grew slower than what I anticipated. I thought people would just be all over this, you know, and it's just taken time because when it comes to money, people want to feel really comfortable. And so they don't necessarily, they don't want to be the guinea pig, you know, that's trying out a new service. So UPMA has been around for a decade now. And I think that it's just, you know, people have, we have a lot of UPMA members who have just kind of tried it out. And they put just, you know, a little bit in and they just kind of watch how things work. And then they decide, hey, you know what, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this a bigger part of my, you know, monetary life. And so they start moving things over. So yeah, that's been, that's been a very interesting thing. And I think along the way, there have been some real kind of key flexion points. You know, one of those, as I mentioned, is the gold back. I think the lease is another where people recognize 
that coupled with the fact that you can't make money, you, you can't get a return on your money in relative safety anymore, right? And so the fact that you know your your uh, savings account at the bank pays virtually zero, and as we've discussed in some areas of the world, you know actually a, a negative return. There's a carrying cost for paper, <laughs> if you can believe that. You know to now be able to get you know um, anywhere from two from one to three percent. That's not one to three basis points. <laughs> right. You know, that's one to three percent. That's like, you know, you're really talking, you know, through these lease programs that we're offering. At that point, you're saying, hey, that's a real monetary system. That's something that can work for me. And when you're looking and you're saying, well, the only other alternatives are maybe I, you know, I'm going to speculate in the crypto market, you know, or, uh, you know, or maybe roll the dice on Wall Street. You know, but being able to actually kind of safeguard um, the fruits of your of a lifetime of labor in a way that isn't really possible anywhere else anymore. You know, it's just it's so hard to find something that actually works. Um, I think that those you know things that we've done and and also where the where the world has moved, you know, in that time period. It's been that comp- combination that I think has drawn but people. If, if the bank still paid 5% on a passbook savings account, then this whole leasing your gold would be less interesting. Right, right. But, you know, unlike all the other wars that the government has waged, a war on drugs, a war on poverty, a war on this, and that, they've mm-hmm. been successful in the war on interest. That one has succeeded on. Yeah. And it's all over with the shouting. Yeah, so it's the you refer to that as the yield on capital. Uh, the, w- what's your phraseology for that? The yield purchasing power. So not yield power. purchasing power, right? Not how much a dollar can buy, but you know, or how many dollars it takes to buy a hamburger, but how many dollars that it takes the interest on those dollars to buy the hamburger, right? And there's been a hyperinflation in um, in yield purchasing power. Yeah. So the difference between earning, you know. Uh, 13 basis points annually and earning 3% annually, that's, that's, that's lifestyle difference. You know, that's, if you could take your money and earn 3% on it, as opposed to, you know, a few basis points that, that changes your life. And then on top of it, as, as we've been saying earlier, the Fed is promising to debase the entire principal amount at 2% per year. And I don't, right. think it's quite, I don't think it's quite as simple as take the interest rate and minus the inflation rate, but clearly whatever rate one might use to impute for the debasement rate, the Fed is struggling mightily to debase their dollar. So even if you got 2% on your dollar, which you can't in a bank, you know, the whole thing is losing value at some rate, which might be less than or greater than 2%. Right. And so they're, they've, you know, one hand give us and the other one take us away even more. Yeah, yeah, that's really key is the medium of exchange that you're using, what's the basket of goods that you can buy with that? What was it a year ago? What was it 10 years ago? What was it 50 years ago? You know, because I think we've talked about this, you know, back when the US had really a precious metal currency for like 150 years, basically a dollar had the same purchasing power. You could buy that same basket of goods um, in 1780 as you could in 1880. As you could, you know, in the early 20th century, even, you know. But it actually went up. You could buy more because methods of production had improved so much during the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then we've just kind of, you know, but it's just we're just a generation, not even a generation, you know, 20 years, just totally weaned us off the whole idea of of a currency that that holds its value over time, and and now it's kind of a joke, you know, to put your, you know, put put your money under your mattress, right? But actually that was that was a legitimate strategy for 150 years in this country. You know, you could put it there and pull it out and it'd have that same purchasing power when Rip Van Winkle woke up a uh, hundred years later. So that's what gold has delivered on quite reliably over the last centuries, millennia. <laughs> so, so one question to wrap up, what's your economic outlook for 2022 and, and beyond? Oh, that's a good question. I think a lot of it kind of depends on where Ukraine kind of takes us. So if we just kind of 
implode into this contentious um, global morass of warring countries, then I think gold just does more of what we have seen over the last few weeks. You know, what it hit, uh, I mean, it, it breached the 2000 mark, you know, that, that people have been eyeing for a long time. So I think that there's a possibility that you could have a continued run up. But I think if, if things kind of stabilize in that regard, depending on how the 20, how this year's elections go in terms of reining in some of the, um, some of the really, how would I put it? Just insane <laughs> spending <laughs> you know, that, that are out there. And if we just come back to a more moderate, you know, kind of, a little more of a hands-off government and, 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 you know, if they'll, if they'll let some of our major industries like the energy industry, uh, you know, give them their head, you know, let, let loose on the reins a little bit. I think that we could kind of move back into what we've seen over the last little bit, but I, I just, I don't know. I'm not confident that those stars are going to align. And so I think that we might. Um, yeah, I was going to say, if, if you find a party that actually is serious about cutting spending, let me know because I'd like to cast my vote for them. Yeah, <laughs> color me cynical right now, but I'm not sure I see any party, any any mainstream party, uh, anywhere close to that. It, it seems like it seems like they're just in totally intent on just saying, "Hey, how far can we actually stretch this thing? How far can we carry this out before it just blows up?" You know, and it's and it's, and it's kind of like this morbid curiosity about you know how irresponsible can we actually be and get away with it? And that's, that's really, that's really tough to see, you know, but, but the thing that I would say is I think that people are waking up more. And I think that as we saw in 2008, the power of the people financially is greater than the power of the government. When people in 2008 started deleveraging, they were deleveraging at a rate that the government could not, that the fed couldn't even, you know, possibly, you know, keep up with. So if people wake up and just say, hey, you know what, we want to change the, the the way that things are running and actually take advantage of laws that are on the books, making gold and silver coin and platinum for that matter, legal tender, and actually building their economic lives around that. I think that we can actually um, put government in its place. Um, I, I think that we have that economic power, you know, as a people, I don't know if we can all Wake up, wake up and do it in a coordinated fashion. But, but I believe that that power economically is, is within us. And, and the other problem that I see is that so many of the large corporations seem to be, you know, totally co-opted and compromised by, you know, political interests that kind of dulls my optimism a little more, but if we can wean ourselves off of the, you know, the corporate, you know, the corporate feeding troughs that are out there, maybe buy locally a little more, um, rely a little more on our kind of our state economies, work to build sound economic principles within our localities. Um, I think that that could have a really good effect in setting examples that people can can follow and want to emulate. So anyway, I'm always the optimist. So I'm <laughs> not going <laughs> to. Well, as long as we've got the silver lining. As long as we've got the right of freedom of speech, we take that away. It's that's all over. But if we can talk about ideas, if you can present something and give them an opportunity to think about and say if they agree or disagree, then um, then there's still hope. Yeah, I think so far on uh, the government has at least given lip service to maintaining that. But interestingly, it's the corporate interests that are silencing what they view as marginal voices or misinformation or whatever. So we we really need to diversify our um, communication. So this podcast is a great example, you know, doing something that's not, you know, going to be filtered through this kind of group think scripted corporate media, you know, so getting voices out there, having real conversations about, you know, actual realities on the ground. Yeah. If we can go there, I think we're going to, I think we're going to make it. Yeah. I, I, I like you have, um, optimism instead of saying it's bleak and depressing and we're going to end up in hell i look at it and say it's daunting i mean there's a lot of work there's certainly no guarantees a major theme in tolkien is hope without guarantees you don't know how it's all gonna work out but mm -hmm. you strive all the more because you have a chance you know just and i think that i think there is i think there is possibility 
So I'm, I'm with you on that one. You know, it's, it's a lot of good stuff. You said a lot of good stuff that I think people need to hear and think about. And if enough people, you know, listen, enough people think, then we can change the world. Well, I always love talking with you. So thank you for, for the opportunity to chat. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and our gold financing simplified. Reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. Make sure to subscribe and we'll see you on the next episode of the Gold Exchange Podcast.